distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to Salzburg Global Seminar. Uh, welcome to our second ever annual education lecture. Uh, a particularly warm welcome to those of you who are joining, especially for this lecture from Plus, students and faculty from Plus, and also from Salis and other partners here in Salzburg. My name is Dominic Register. I'm the Director of Education here and the Director of our Centre for Education and Transformation. Um, for those of you who don't know, Salzburg Global Seminar is an independent, non-profit organisation. Our mission is to challenge current and future leaders to shape a better world. And we do that today through five key programme pillars. So work in health, in peace and justice, in finance and governance, in culture and in education. And we believe that those five things together are the building blocks of stable and prosperous societies that will allow all citizens to thrive and live well in the 21st century. Um, we were founded in 1947 in an era of post-war reconstruction, and the topic of today's lecture is very much focused on a 21st century war, the war against misinformation, which polarizes and divides communities, cities, and countries around the world. Um, as many of you already know, because you've been living and breathing it for the last couple of days, the lecture is also taking place within a program as part of our Education for Tomorrow's World series, which is focused on civic and civil education, identity and belonging in the 21st century. Um, and we're delighted to be able to host Jessica as the lecturer within this wider program. Um, so what's going to happen today in a second, I will hand over to Councillor for Public Affairs, Elizabeth martin Shukran from the US Embassy in Vienna, and she will make some opening remarks and then introduce the lecturer. We'll then have Jessica's lecture, and we'll then open it up for a Q&A with all of you. So please think of questions uh, while Jessica is delivering the lecture. And then after that, we'd be delighted if you would all join us for a bonfire reception by the lake in front of the palace. Um, so without further ado, um, it's been an enormous privilege to partner with the US Embassy in Vienna uh, on this specific program and this lecture. We have quite a long-standing relationship with the embassy through um, our annual American Studies program and through work in our media academy. It's been an absolute delight to work with you on this. And thank you, Julia and Elizabeth, for your support. So it's a great pleasure to now introduce the Council of Public Affairs, Elizabeth Martin Schuchman. everybody for being here. Thank you for being here. Um, my name is Elizabeth Martin Shukrun. I'm the Counselor for Public Affairs and Public Diplomacy at the U.S. Embassy in Vienna. And we're very proud to be able to partner with you um, for this seminar uh, and to support in particular uh, the keynote address tonight by, uh, by Jessica Roberts. I wanted to just give you, for my opening remarks, uh, just a sense of why. why. Why is the U.S. Embassy involved in this? Um, and for those of you who know anything about the United States, you know that sort of our fundamental document um, in the U.S. is our Constitution, right? And that Constitution starts with the Bill of Rights, um, which are these ten amendments to the Constitution that guarantee the basic fundamental rights of every U.S. citizen. Um, and in that First Amendment, uh, in the Bill of Rights, there's the guaranteed the right of uh, freedom of press and freedom of speech. And these are really fundamental values from the very beginning of the United States of what it means to be an American, to have those rights. Um, but we all also know that those rights, that Bill of Rights is really a Bill of Rights and Responsibilities. The responsibilities that we have as citizens, that we have as educators, as parents, as uh, friends, to ensure that that speech um, and to ensure that our press are transmitting true information, that are contributing positively um, to our democracy, to our society, and to our communities. Um, I think a lot of us, as again, as citizens, as parents, as uh, as global, um, as global people, as educators, find this to be a particularly difficult time um, to exercise those rights and those responsibilities. Misinformation and, at times, unfortunately, deliberate disinformation. Um, are really seeking to divide us. That's the aim of some of this. It's not just a question of giving someone incorrect information. Sometimes we're talking about coordinated, strategic use of disinformation to divide communities, to create schisms within communities, within countries, um, and to undermine trust 
to undermine trust in our democratic institutions, to undermine trust in journalism, in media, in the, to undermine trust in the actual idea of there being the truth. Um, and so it's really important right now. It's a difficult time to be a journalist. <laughs> I have so much respect for journalists uh, right now because they're constantly pushing back on, on all of these untruths that surround us and trying to be this glimmer of light. Uh, it's a hard time to be an educator. It's a hard time to be a citizen as we wade through all of this. And that's why it's so incredibly important to have discussions like the one that the Salzburg Global Seminar is putting together this week um, to make sure that you, as educators, uh, as journalists, as civil society activists, are having discussions, sharing best practices, um, thinking how we can help young people and not so young people who are dealing with these, with these issues um, understand the problems, think critically about information, uh, and honor those fundamental values of freedom of speech and freedom of the press. So thanks for all that you do um, to, to support democratic values, to support those fundamental values, which while in the US Constitution are really human values, right? Um, so I'm going to, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Jessica Roberts as well. Jessica is an assistant professor <coughs> of communication studies at the Faculty of Human Sciences at the Universidad Católica Portuguesa. She's a co-author of the 2018 book, American Journalism and Fake News, examining the facts, uh, examining the facts. And her recent research in citizen journalism and social media has been published in Journalism and the International Journal of Communication. Uh, Jessica Roberts earned her PhD at the University of Maryland and her master's degree at the University of Southern California. I hope you all have a wonderful lecture and thank you again for all that you're doing. Hi. Uh, first of all, thanks to Dominic and thanks to the counselor from the U.S. Embassy. <laughs> um, it is really an honor to speak to you and kind of humbling, I think, being in the room with all of my colleagues who we've been working together this week and realizing how much experience. Uh, I think Joel's bio says he's given 350 keynotes, and I thought I should have asked him for some tips. <laughs> um, <laughs> But so uh, when I was thinking about these remarks, I thought I would describe it as um, rather than offering sort of my authoritative dis declaration of this is how things are, really kind of a um, spark for us to, to think about how to move forward together, some ideas that we might put into effect. But over the last couple days, I have realized it's more of like I'm channeling all of you because the things we've been talking about really play into what I'd like to talk about today. So I have a clicker, yes, okay. So what I'm going to talk about is misinformation and disinformation and what I'm suggesting is kind of a different angle from which we can approach this problem. Um, I'm gonna briefly summarize why misinformation and disinformation are particularly successful in our current online environment. I think a lot of us in the room, especially uh, after our uh, discussions yesterday and even about polarization today, we're on the same page, but I'd like to get everyone else caught up um, and then outline the dangers of misinformation to democratic societies, to free people and self-determination in general, and then address some of the solutions that have been put forth and make my argument for what I think is approaching from a slightly different angle, not dismissing any of those other things, but saying I think maybe we could make these things all work together. So uh, I also want to say a little caveat at the beginning, which is, I know there's a tendency sometimes to take the problems that we're dealing with as like the first time these things have happened or this is the most it's ever happened. I see it in my students' papers when they write, this is the fastest communication has ever evolved. Um, and so I do want to caution against overstating uh, the uniqueness of what we're dealing with while also acknowledging that there are some factors in our current information system that are different and are making misinformation and disinformation more successful. So uh, I'm also going to suggest that we work with a slightly different term, which is junk news, uh, which is a broader category of information that includes misinformation and disinformation, but also things like sensationalist news, masked commentary, conspiracy theories, all these kinds of information that are not, frankly, really information, um, but uh, play in the same environment and do the same thing, which is really pollute our general information environment. 
So why is junk news um, and misinformation so successful in our current media environment? Uh, well, misinformation, disinformation, junk news are not new. They found particular success uh, for a few key reasons related to structural factors, right, in our information ecosystem, um, which my colleagues discussed yesterday. Uh, the proliferation of information, the attention economy, algorithmic sorting of content, bots, um, fake accounts, and even human-run uh, fake accounts, um, and the fact that creating content is cheaper, easier, faster than it has ever been, and the content that is made can look really professional and circulate in exactly the same spaces that professionally produced or fact-based information circulates. Um, so junk news producers can cheaply and quickly create whatever stories they like, uh, or even copy stories from other countries and languages, tapping into these networks of junk news creators that exist, and then that content can be made to mimic the look and style of uh, real news, as fake news does, or adopt catchy, funny, uh, shareable memes that will go viral. Junk news creators can add as much uh, morally outrageous content as they want to any story, knowing that that emotion is most likely to garner engagement. They can do A-B testing of headlines or stories or whole posts to determine which one is the most successful and then send that one out. Uh, they can boost those stories with follows and shares from bots, automated or fake human-run accounts as part of what Oxford sociologist Philip Howard called lie machines, which is this treadmill of production, distribution, and marketing that goes across international borders. And all those efforts are likely to gain traction because of the information ecosystem in which that information will circulate. So algorithms on social media favor things like recency in their prioritizing results. They favor content that is getting a lot of engagement. And as we know, the content that is likely to provoke outrage, especially moral outrage, gets the most engagement. While that is all going on, professional journalists and fact-based content creators are busily seeking comment from first-hand sources, um, authoritative um, institutions, uh, looking for research in publicly available databases or uh, documents, public records, or otherwise engaging in processes of verification, which fake news and junk news creators have no such uh, obligation to do. So junk news can be out the door and disseminating wildly while a factual account is still being carefully prepared. So it is not an even playing field on which journalists and others compete. And while misinformation is not new, the fact that that content is easier to create and easier to circulate combined with those conditions of information proliferation and spread on social media sites creates a more fertile environment for it. What is not new is the human cognitive system, which did not develop to handle a constant stream of complex messages delivered at all times of the day and all areas of our lives, right? We consume entertainment content, personal messages, news, professional correspondence, weather, sports, all through the same device, and we do it everywhere. We do it in bed, in the kitchen, in the bathroom, on the subway, at cafes and restaurants at work, even while we're walking. <laughs> Um, but our cognitive system is being taxed by this constant intake and processing of all that information. And we already know that things like confirmation bias and the hostile media effect, our fast and slow ways of processing information, and our appetite for dopamine, uh, as we talked about yesterday, mean that we're not particularly well prepared to handle the constant stream of mediatized information that we get all day and to rationally respond to it, evaluate it, think about it in the context of everything else we know. That's not how we're processing this, right? Um, in the attention economy online, where the competition for attention is getting more and more intense, our cognitive resources are strained, and we're likely to opt for our faster heuristic or shortcut ways of thinking, right, that are based on previous things that we've learned or thought, even stereotypes, um, and we respond often emotionally. Additionally, the public is increasingly polarized and skeptical of traditional mainstream journalism organizations, which makes them even more receptive to junk news and more susceptible to believing in conspiracy theories. People who are disenchanted with the failures of their government, with corporate abuse, with a housing crisis, with a climbing cr climate crisis, with a political crisis, who are uh, uh, isolated and angry, as our colleague said today, aggrieved, 
they make for really great targets for this kind of information that makes them feel better, right? Confirms what they think. Um, and so that creates, it contributes to, and combines with those structural factors to really make misinformation, junk news, masked commentary, conspiracy theories very successful. Uh, all of this, of course, is very concerning to those of us who want to live in free democratic societies. A well-informed public, of course, is essential to the survival of democratic governments, to self-determination in general, and likely to our survival as a species, given the climate crisis. An uninformed and misinformed public is of great concern, particularly in systems where people have the power to make decisions about their government, uh, but also in places where the public is not actively engaging in their uh, self-government, where their choices and behaviors still affect the people around them, right? So the dangers of junk news are that people may fail to properly understand the problems that face them. At a micro level, they may lack accurate information to make choices in their daily lives, and at a macro level, uh, be inhibited in their ability to elect leaders who will act in their self-interest. Misinformation, of course, can also harm the public even if people don't necessarily take it in and believe it. This general uncertainty about what is true contributes to audiences losing trust in institutions and especially in mainstream media. Um, these are a couple different slides uh, from the US, the UK, and Austria about what kinds of news stories or misinformation people are concerned about. And essentially, all these different kinds of misinformation are vastly concerning to people, right? So uh, more people are turning away from the news due to fatigue, and growing numbers are turning to these alternatives or sources of information, which are often unreliable. Uh, even communities of conspiracy theorists, like the QAnon conspiracy, where believers find common cause and uh, experience this kind of participatory journalism project with other people, albeit based on a, based on a completely false and unverifiable uh, story. News fatigue, stemming from the sense that the news is overly negative and that there's nothing people can do about it anyway, information proliferation and overload, leads people to turn away from the news altogether, which also contributes to this problem, creating a public that is uninformed. Uh, misinformation and junk news also pose risks to journalists and other fact-based information creators like fact-checkers who suffer emotional consequences from dealing with these misinformed and polarized audiences who find their work not just bad or uh, lacking in some way, but offensive, harmful, an attack on their side or their candidate. Um, so journalists who are already facing multiple challenges brought on by economic and technical changes in their industry face backlash that often moves into the offline personal realm. Um, fact checkers experience that same thing, but also express feelings of despair about the public. In research we've done um, in interviews with fact checkers, they find that despite their best efforts to lay out in a very coherent, carefully documented, publicly verifiable, thoroughly examined, uh, well-researched explanation of the veracity or falsehood of a claim, people will totally dismiss it and will circulate it again and again. Uh, they have also begun to feel that there's some portion of the audience that is hopeless, that is beyond helping, that no matter how many convincing facts you present to them, they will never change their mind. Uh, and unfortunately, I believe someone brought this up today too, there's some support for this in research, right, about misinformation and its correction, which has led to the labeling of the phenomenon of the backfire effect in which people presented with information that contradicts their views will simply double down on those incorrect views rather than say, oh yes, gee, you're, that, that's, uh, I'm sorry, I was wrong. <laughs> Um, some fact checkers also express hopelessness about their ability to make any difference against the sea of misinformation that just feels overwhelming and continues to grow, and in many cases, continues to come back again and again even after claims have been debunked, leading to one of our uh, interviewees describing the phenomenon as zombie misinformation. <laughs> so the dangers are clear. The solutions, we've talked about a lot of those uh, in these sessions, and the solutions are, you know, for some time journalists have explored different things like maybe if they're more transparent about their reporting and their sources, trying to frame their stories differently. So like solutions journalism is an approach that has been tried uh, with some evidence of success. 
Um, so research shows that readers of solutions journalism feel greater levels of self-efficacy, uh, for example. Uh, the growth of fact-checking sites themselves, I think, can be seen as a response to the growth of the spread of misinformation and junk news online. Um, and then, of course, there's the front against uh, the audience side, which is media literacy. And media literacy initiatives, courses, materials are already being implemented in many places around the world. And I think that though we all agree that that is very important. I don't want to diminish the importance of that. We have to continue to teach people of all ages about the potential for misinformation, provide them with tools to identify and dismiss junk news and misinformation, tools like inoculation and pre-bunking, which we discussed yesterday. Um, but my argument is that we need to think about how we make sure that those people feel a need to use those tools that they see, yeah, you know what, there's a reason I'm going to apply what I learned in my media literacy class. So what I've been thinking about recently is the idea that rather than trying to address sort of the outcomes of misinformation to provide more accurate information or better fact checking or teach people how to identify it, we need to get to the root of the problem on the audience side, which is this sense of disconnection, isolation, loneliness, or a feeling that it doesn't matter what you do, right? A feeling of powerlessness. Um, and I think we do this by building up communities and fostering audiences that support democratic values and thus have an interest in determining the truth of information because that will be useful to them. I've been wondering that if we might, uh, rather than just inoculating audiences or arming them with tools, do a better job of making them healthier in the first place and thus more robust in defending themselves against misinformation. By healthier, I mean audiences that feel more connected and more supported, perhaps a greater sense of belonging, as we talked about yesterday, and therefore more invested in their community and a democratic form of government, and then also perhaps more open to and interested in accurate, actionable information that they can use to improve their lives and the lives of people around them. So I think education is one of the best areas to do this work. We will need to think about how we can create the conditions in which students see democracy working, um, develop support for democratic values, develop belief in the value of building consensus, and develop empathy for their fellow citizens. So I think we can consider the who, the what, and the how of education in finding opportunities to cultivate empathy and build community in educational contexts. Schools are a place where we come into contact with others in our community, and research on the impact of getting to know people who are not like us, particularly members of minority groups, suggests that it can reduce prejudice. This is known as the contact hypothesis, and it's been studied as relates to racial minorities, religious minorities, and gay men. Um, and the re research suggests that it would be beneficial to reducing, reducing prejudice if our schools reflect the communities in which we all live and our countries. Um, it's also been tested as it relates to parasocial contact, that is contact through the media, movies, or books. Um, this means that our classrooms should also be places where students learn about other people in the world and in ways that humanize them and allow our students to connect with those people and their stories. Uh, you may be familiar you also may be wondering why I have this picture of Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie up here, but uh, she had a very popular TED talk in 2011 called The Danger of a Single Story about this idea of if we assign overly simplistic one-word labels to people, and she used examples from her childhood about the son of their cleaning lady who she only knew as poor, and so that became his all-encompassing definition, and her own experiences moving to the U.S., and her college roommates' uh, simplistic ideas about Africans. Um, so learning about other people from their own experiences, about the richness of their experiences and feelings can help reduce prejudice and increase understanding of them. Um, some studies of the contact hypothesis have found particular value in exercises involving perspective taking in which students are asked to imagine themselves in the position of another person. So we can add these kinds of exercises to our classroom activities and assignments. I also think you know, this is a somewhat, let's say, um, cheesy version of exposing people to everyone in their community. Um, and yet, representation, I think we can all agree, matters. I also wanted to mention uh, the Humans of New York social media feed, which I've done some research on, and his strategy, which is to photograph people, and at this point it's all over the world, 
but to then uh, essentially let them speak for themselves and share aspects of their lives. But they tend to be aspects that are easy for other people to relate to, things like work, relationships, and family, rather than, um, for example, when he's gone to refugee camps, you know, the hor horrific conditions in the camps where people would just maybe feel pity for you. They can actually see something of themselves in you, and maybe then it's easier for them to develop empathy for you. Um, I would also like to say that as schools in the United States, for example, tend to, are moving towards this like emphasizing science and STEM and moving away from, therefore, literature and the humanities, I think we risk losing that area of education where empathy is most likely to be experienced, right? Where we get the most practice in putting ourselves in other people's shoes. So we need to ensure that those uh, areas remain in our curricula. Um, so the practice of people being together in physical spaces to learn is one of the best opportunities we have to build empathy for our fellow citizens and to create community and thus to foster audiences who will care about democracy, care about consensus, and hopefully care about the quality of information they take in. Uh, so what should students learn then? I think we've talked about civic education and media literacy are obviously still important. Students need to learn about the processes through which consensus is found, how their governments work, uh, particularly how they can be involved in democratic processes, and providing those skills and information to students uh, to allow them to effectively participate in democracy can raise their feelings of self-efficacy and their confidence to engage in democratic processes. They also need to learn about the structure of the media systems and the online information environment uh, to understand the forces that shape the information they come across, right? On top of this, teaching them emotional regulation, and I think this has come up several times uh, this week as well, will help them deal with the feelings that they may experience while taking in this outmo uh, emotionally outrageous information all day teaching them how to navigate a complicated, demanding, and negative, emotionally charged information ecosystem will mean they will know what they should do to more effectively process and respond to information they encounter. So they need that knowledge and skill set, but I think, again, they also need the motivation, the desire to participate, the investment in their community, and the belief that it matters that they participate and their community cares about them. And so this is where I think the how uh, comes into play, and I, again, something we talked about, I think, today that leads into this nicely. I think this provides a great opportunity to show students the important, importance excuse me, of empathy and community. So the way we construct our classrooms and make them spaces where decisions are made together, the way we value our students and encourage them to value each other, this is where we can show them rather than tell them about the importance of community and consensus and belonging by practicing student-centered group-based activities, for example, where students collaborate and have to work together, or creating conditions for democratic decision-making in our classrooms, we may be able to help them see the value of working to find consensus with others and to believe in the importance of considering the opinions and perspectives of others. Um, so if we make students feel like valued participants in their own educational journey, we can help them develop an understanding of their own power um, and even make them feel cared for and important as if their voice matters uh, because it does. I hope students who feel this way will then be more inclined to call on those skills in media literacy and civics and read as if they live in the 1980s um, and apply them to their daily information intake. I hope they'll be more invested in finding out what is true so that they can use it in their daily lives and those citizenship activities to which they have access. This is where I think we can win the fight against misinformation by providing students with media literacy skills, information, uh, empowering them to feel the self-efficacy that they need to navigate the modern media environment, and also by cultivating in them a, dire, a desire to do so, the motivation to be part of a community that feels like it includes them and will work for them if they invest in it, connecting them with people in their communities and making them feel like they belong. So that's my pitch, and I hope we'll find a way to work on that together. <laughs>